السلام علیکم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ الحمد للہ رب العالمین نحمد و نستعین و نستغفر و نؤمن به و نتوقع علیہ و نعوذ بلا من شور انفسنا من سیعت احمالنا و یحد اللہ فلا مدل فمن یلہ فلا حد یلہ نشد و لا الہ الا اللہ وحده لا شریک لہ وَشَدْ عَنَّ مُحَمِّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمَّا بَعْدِ And brothers and sisters, I'm very thankful to Allah the Almighty to have the great privilege to be with you here tonight. I pray that He, the one whom we worship, will bless us. And I'm especially happy to see you tonight on a Monday night and to come out of your homes together to worship for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, today, um, tonight, for a few moments, I want to talk about a real serious uh, topic. It's a topic that every one of us sh should be interested in. It's a topic about money. And it's a topic about the use of that money with wisdom. I guarantee you every time you go to the marketplace, every time you go to a store, the question that you hear over and over again is how much does it cost? And you have to make a decision whether you buy that house, that car, that suit, that dress, those shoes, how much does it cost? Everything has a price. And the question is, are you willing to pay that price? Tonight I was given the topic, the currency of the hereafter. Brothers and sisters, every country you go to, have their own money. I will name the place and you will tell me the name of that currency. France, Frank. Germany, Mark. Italy, Lira. Great Britain, Mecca, Real. Pakistan, Rupee. The hereafter. The hereafter. Brothers and sisters, what make us separate from those who disbelieve? Alladina yu'minun al those who believe in the hereafter. One thing that we all have in common tonight is that we bear witness that everybody is going to die. Kullu nafsin da'ikatul maut. Every soul shall taste of death. 139 million people a year will die on this planet. Every two seconds, nine babies are born and three people die. And brothers and sisters, every moment you live, you are that closer to the grave. The currency of the hereafter. What would it be after we die? I would like to focus uh, today's talk on basically two hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam it will be the basis of my discussion the currency of the hereafter when you look at this money that we have this dollar bill has no intrinsic value of its own this by itself can't help you. You can't eat it. 
It has no real value except that we give it a value. And we exchange this money for something of real value. We give somebody a dollar and we get bread. Bread to eat to sustain our life. Bread has value because it can give us life. A dollar bill has no real value. Except in our minds, we accept it as a value. <clears throat> I have here, what is this? Can you tell? What is it? A Canadian dollar. You want it? You have it. Who would trade me my 10 Canadian dollar for your 10 US dollar? Anyone? Do I have any such people in the audience tonight? <laughs> this money, if you go to the store in Miami to buy bread, with this, they won't accept it. They won't accept it because it's not the right currency. If you go to Canada and use this money, it's good. And you can buy goods because it's the right currency. So every country you go in, they have their own currency. And in order for you to use this, you have to stop in the exchange, the money exchange, and say, look, I like to exchange this so that I can have some currency in this country so that I can buy the things that I need. Fair? This has no value to a bird. This has no value to an insect, to an animal. Water has value. Air has real value. But I want you to see tonight, brothers and sisters, that this has no real value. Sometimes the money devalues. And you can't buy what you used to buy with these things. It fluctuates, it changes. And every kind of life has its own things of value. A fish, an insect, an animal, a plant, all of them have different forms of value. In the same way, animals, countries, insects, and plants have their own value. So does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has its value. And so tonight, we want to talk about, I think, one of the most important topics. And that is the currency of the hereafter. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا مات الإنسان انقطع أعماله When a person dies his deeds his works are cut off إلا من ثلاثة except for three and maybe we'll talk about that later So we know death is important because death is the door to the hereafter what separates this life in the life of the hereafter is death. You can't go there except through death. Death, And everybody will experience death sooner or later. And by the way, brothers and sisters, um, uh, before this talk is over, I'm going to share you, um, with you some research that I did based on an ayat of Al-Quran. So, we die. The door to the hereafter. The door to the unseen. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The Prophet said in this very um, powerful hadith. Yatba'ul mayata thalatha. Three things follow the dead person. Now all of us read this hadith before, I'm sure. Three things. Follow a dead person. Farjul Ithnain. Two things go back. For Yabqal Mahu Wahid. And one thing remains. You ever notice the Prophet said three things follow the dead person? Al Mayita. Tadba ul Mayata. Three things follow the dead person. 
He says the three things that follow it is, is ahluhu, wa maluhu, wa amaluhu. A person's family follows the dead person to the grave. A person's wealth follows a person to the grave. Why did he say wealth follows a person to the grave? He said, no, wealth, wealth, don't, follow, wealth don't follow a person to the grave. Wealth follows a person while they're alive. Why did the prophet say wealth follows a person to the grave? There's wisdom in that. And he said his works, his deeds, his family, his wealth, and his deeds. Family go back, uh, property goes back, and the only thing that remains in the grave of that person is his deeds. Brothers and sisters, does anyone know, uh, read the Fortune magazine? Any of you read the Fortune magazine? Forbes? Okay. A couple of months ago, brother, they had the wealthiest people in the world and in America. Did you read that article? You did? Who read it? Who's the wealthiest American? William Gates. How wealthy is he? Hold on to your seats. Eight $18 billion. Now, I wish you could have got the camera when I said $18 billion. Nobody responded. You know why? Because you don't know what $18 billion is. No, you don't. You don't. Well, lie, you don't. You haven't got a clue. All you know is a lot of money. That's why I said $18 billion. He said, But let me put it in perspective for you. Not far from here, Orlando, there was a basketball player. He left that team and went to Los Angeles. His name is Shaquille O'Neal. He signed a contract with the Los Angeles Lakers for $121 million. A seven-year contract. That's more than $21 million a year. Now, is that a lot of money? $21 million a year? Let me put it in perspective William Gates' money compared to Shaquille O'Neal. Shaquille O'Neal making $21 million a year would have to make that for 1,040 years to equal the wealth of William Gates. Now you know how much money it is? That's a lot of money. But you know what? All of us need money. You need money. You know why? Because you're a human being, and you live in the dunya, and you need money. Yes, you do. Don't let nobody tell you you don't need money. You have to live in a house. You have to pay rent. You have to buy a house. You have to buy a car. You have to buy food and clothing, education for your children, a masjid, a madrasa to Islamia, a school, we need money. But we have to understand the true value of money. And it is not money, but what the money can do for you. Now, brothers and sisters, the lesson that we learn is this. If William Gates dies today, $18 billion, from the moment he's buried, no longer belongs to him. If you study Al-Quran and if you study Sunnah, you will see there's a whole chapter in uh, a Sunnah and Hadith called Al-Fara'id, Al-Fara'id and Wasiyya. Al-Fara'id wal Wasiyya. When a person dies, where does the wealth go? How much does the mother get? How much does the father get? How much does the children get? How much does the brother, the sister get? How much? How much did you bequeath to somebody else? Because the moment that you die, money is taken out of your wealth to bury you. But after you're buried, 
what's left over is no longer your money. Let me tell you how heavy the Prophet Muhammad was, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Brothers and sisters, never take the messenger of Allah for granted and anything that he says is light. Everything that he says is deep because he's guided by Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Ibn Adam, the son of Adam, Adam, Yaqul, Mali, Mali, my wealth, my wealth. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, gave us the reality of your wealth. He said, your, re your real wealth, that which belongs to you, is what you eat and consume. If it's laying around a piece of bread, it doesn't really belong to you until you consume it. Your clothing, what you wear, and it's worn out. And the sadaqah that you spend, that you send out ahead of you, that belongs to you. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. This dollar in my pocket, if I pay tonight sadaqah, I spent a dollar for Allah, that's mine. I will see it on your Qiyamah. But as long as it's in my possession, it doesn't really belong to me. It's not really mine. The reality of wealth is what you do with it. Now, brothers and sisters, let's come to our point, inshallah, and then we try to um, open up for questions and answers. I want you right now, brothers and sisters, to all the brothers that are married, raise your hand. Okay. I want you now to think about your wife. They gotta think about you sometimes, right? <laughs> and sisters, I want you to think about your husbands. You got them in your mind? Now think about your mother and your father. You see your wife, your mother and father? Some of you, now think about your children. Love them. Love your wife, love your children. You love your mom and dad. Now I want you to think about your own death. And I want you to see yourself going in the casket. And I want you to see somebody picking you up over their shoulder. I want you to see somebody washing you and shrouding you when you can't wash yourself and you can't shroud yourself. And I want you to see the picture of them taking you to the grave. And then I want you to see and visualize them putting you in the grave and putting the dirt over your face. Can you see it? And now I want you to think about your wife walking away from you. Your husband walking away from you. Your mother and father walking away from you alone in the grave. Your children walking away from you. I want you to think about your computers and I want you to think about your fine houses and I want you to think about all your nice clothes and your shoes and I want, to th want you to think about all the education that you have and I want you to think about your bank account and I want you to start thinking now that oh oh it's all over, it's finished and now, now I am in the grave by myself and everybody walk away. So the prophet said, three things follow you. Two go back, your family members. No matter how much they love you, they're not going down there with you. You know, years ago I read a, a magazine called Jet Magazine. You ever had Jet Magazine? Could you imagine there was a rich guy that died? They actually buried the fool in his car. You remember that, right? 
See, I'm not making it up. He had a Mercedes, I think a Mercedes Benz or, or I think it was Mercedes Benz, and buried the fool in the car. And I'm sure someone dug that thing up. Got that car. Because the reality, brothers and sisters, it don't work where we're going. It has no value. And the key is, in order to get some value, we have to exchange it now. And all I want to do tonight and remind all of us is that in order for you to get some reward in the hereafter, you have to exchange what you have now for the new currency and the currency of the hereafter. The currency of the hereafter, brothers and sisters, is simply good deeds. You know, if you read the Quran carefully, Allah will ask the disbelievers, if Allah gave you all of the wealth on earth and wealth equal to it, would you use that to ransom yourself from the fire? And everybody would say yes. But you know what? If you had all of the wealth in the hereafter, it won't work. But guess what? If you in this life and you spend even a half a date, that may save you from the fire. Because the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, save yourselves from the fire even with half a date. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to conclude with this ayat from the Quran that really touched me. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الناس إن كنتم في ريب من البعث فإن خلقناكم من تراب O mankind, if you have a doubt about the resurrection, consider that we Allah created you from dust. Dust. Even the scientists bear witness that man comes from the earth. Think about that. Thuma minutfa, then a sperm. I mean, brothers and sisters, think about it. Think about man, the man with all of these scientific advancements. Where does he come from? From dust. He come from sperm. Thuma min alaka, then a clot. Now man is growing. Thuma mudga, mudga. wa ghairi mukhalaka. Ah. Formed and partly formed, a piece of flesh. Hmm? So now man is growing from dust and from sperm and from a clot, and then man continues to grow. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, to teach you. And then we keep you in the womb for an appointed term. Then we bring you out as babies. You look at the picture. Litablugu ashuddakum. So that you reach that age of strength. Look at these brothers here. Strong. Some of them play football, some of them run track. Strong. Women reach the age of maturity, beautiful, strong, by Allah's permission. What did he do? He brought them from a baby. Now look at them speaking. You have doubt about the resurrection? How you speak? Dust, sperm, water, clot. Now look at the lost creation, and now this man becomes a scientist, and he makes planes, and he goes in space, and he makes telescopes and microscopes, and he has his mind, and he grows, and look at all of the creation that he makes, be idhnillah, by the permission of Allah. And then this is the verse I want to share with you. وَمِنْ كُمْ مَنْ يُتَوَفَّهُ وَمِنْ كُمْ مَنْ يُرَدَّ إِلَىٰ أَذَلِ الْعُمَرِ لِكَيْ لَا يَعْلَمَ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِلْمَا شَيْعَ Subhanallah. And then some of you 
he calls to die. And then some of you, if you live long enough, he send you back to that abject age so that after having known much, you know little. You know, once, um, about seven years ago, I was home, and I led my family in Salat. And while I was praying, I can hear one of my children reciting along with me. And I was reciting a long surah. And I'm reciting, and I'm hearing them, I'm hearing them right along with me. As I'm reciting, they're reciting along with me. And when I'm finished the Salat, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, I said, who was that? One of my young girls. Uh, wallahi, I don't remember which one. I don't, I, it was either Sadaqah, Basma, Sharifa, Sajda. It wasn't Sajda. But it was one of them, right? And I said, who taught you that surah? He said, he said Abby, you taught me. Dad, you taught me. I, I said, I didn't teach you that surah. And yes, you did. I said, when? She said, I heard you recite it before. And I learned it. She heard me recite it once, and she learned it, and she was rec recite my child, not Arab, I don't think, African-American. How she do that? Brothers and sisters, you'd be surprised what your children can learn. So many of the children out there learn hip-hop music. And can't memorize ayat or Quran only because we don't emphasize, we don't teach them. And you know what? I went to South Africa, went to a conference there, and we stopped for Salat al Maghrib. And they took a young brother, about 19 years old, to lead the Salat. This recitation of this young boy, Hafiz Al-Quran, young man, 18, I think 18 or 19 years old, was great recitation, South Africa in Cape Town. And I said, man, this young man's recitation was so good that when the Salat was over, I was so excited. I said, listen, man, I'm going to sit here and wait to Isha because I want to hear some more of this recitation. And when Salat to Isha came, they chose another brother to lead Salat. And I have to confess, I had an attitude. Can you imagine an imam, right? Just because they choose another brother to lead the slot rather than the other brother, I'm saying, man, I wanted to hear that brother recite. Wallahi Aveen, this brother who recited Isha was better than the one who recited Maghrib. And then another Hafiz of Quran, at Fajr prayer, got another young man, 17 years old, South Africa, Hafiz of Quran, recited, he led the Salat in Fajr. They had about seven or eight of them at camp. And you know what? All of them memorized the Quran. But guess what? If they live long enough, Allah is going to cause a reversal so that after having known much, you know little. And this is Quran, by the way. And whoever we extend their life, we reverse the life. Reverse them. And this is why the Prophet used to say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bi qalban harami. Oh Allah, I seek refuge from harami. Sen senility. Old age. To such a degree that there's a reversal. Think of mother. Think how when she gives birth to the baby, how she attends to the baby. She feeds the baby. She nurses the baby. She changes the baby. She teaches the baby. Say, say daddy. Training the baby. Teaching the baby to walk. Teaching the baby to talk. But then the baby gets older and independent and strong and wise. But then if Allah allowed him to live long enough, it starts to change. Hair gets gray. It falls out. Teeth 
fall out, back, bent over. Beautiful, her form will change. Let her live long enough, this is the way of Allah. Why? So you never get proud. Never think you got it made. Never think you're this or that. Because Allah will show you as you are, you are, in, you are dependent from the very beginning. Allah make you dependent all over again in your old age. So what's the key? The key is if you want to get somewhere in the hereafter, you can't wait too long. You got to spend it now. Now, brothers and sisters, let me show this research that I did, and then we close out, inshallah. I, when I read ayats from the Quran, I like to read and study it, and then study what's happening around. Look at this ayat. No soul can die except by the permission of Allah is written in the book. How come a person is shot 15 times point blank range and live? And another person slips on a banana peeling and die. I actually read about a woman who fell from a plane and lived. Yeah, fell on some real soft mud and lived. Why? It's Allah. You see, the tendency with young people to think that death is the monopoly for old people. But according to this ayat, Allah takes people at different stages. How come a woman carries a baby eight months and maybe have a miscarriage? Or a baby is born and lives for one day, one month, one year. Some people die at two, some at five, some 15, some 20. Another person lives to be 120. Why? Allah. So let me tell you what I studied and found out. The World Health Organization estimates that in 1990, about 13.1 million children under the age of five died in one year. Monopoly, death, not for old people. Of this total, 9.4 million were less than one year old. And 3.7 million were one to four years old. He said, oh, but that's for, for the developing nations. Not like a country like America. Well, let's look at it. Look at this. Last year, the last time this figure was taken, approximately 2,268,000 deaths in the United States. Right? Wouldn't it be nice to figure out of those people that died, what ages did they die? I did the research, and let me share this with you before we close out. Under one years old, 33,300 babies died in the United States. From five to 14 years old, I'm sorry, one to four years old, 7,020. From five to 14 years old, 8,740. From 15 to 34, how many of you 15 to 34, raise your hand. Raise them up high. I'm talking about your category now. 15 to 34, 
59,740 people died. From 25 to 34, 59,740. From 35 to 44, 95,920. So forth and so on. Brothers and sisters, the reason that I mention all of this is that soon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to take us. Or he's going to make us live a long, long time. The key to the success of life is don't, work, work, don't wait. Change right now the currency that you have in this world and change it over to the hereafter. And how we do that, inshallah, is work for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why we're told in the Quran, spin out of what we have provided for you before death comes and there's no more spending. And on that day, inshallah, all of us will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a little bit more time to do what? To go back, to do some more good deeds. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to let you know tonight that deeds are real. Deeds, both good and bad, are real. And I want you to go back to the words of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. If a person has gold and didn't pay zakat on that gold, on Yom Al-Qiyamah, Allah will melt that gold and brand the people with that gold. If a person has a camel and don't pay zakat on the camel, that camel, those camels will punish us on Yom Al-Qiyamah. Deeds are real. And when our family walk away, and we're there in the grave by ourselves, the only thing that we have is our deeds. Inshallah, I want to remind you as I sit down, that now is the time to work hard for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if a person has a habit of doing good deeds, when he's sick or on a journey, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him as he was when he was home and well. For instance, let's say you get up every morning at 4 o'clock to make salat to tahajjud. Every morning, 4 o'clock. And then you get sick. And you're sick for three weeks. Do you know that if you had a habit of making tahajjud, Allah will reward you as if you made those tahajjud? Because you had the habit of doing that. Or if you traveled. So what I'm saying today, inshallah, is transform all of these things of this dunya into something of meaning. And that is something for the akhirah, some good deeds, insha'Allah. And the Prophet said, finally, if this earth, if this dunya, all of it, equaled in the sight of Allah, even a, 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 a drop of water, if this, oh, no, I'm sorry, if all of this dunya equaled a wing of a mosquito, all of this dunya, if it equaled a wing of a mosquito, Allah wouldn't give a disbeliever even a drop of water. You didn't hear what I said. If all of this dunya equaled in the eyesight of Allah to a wing of a mosquito, then Allah wouldn't give a kafir in it even a sip of water. If all of this dunya together, if it equaled in the eyesight of Allah, a wing of a mosquito, Allah wouldn't give a calf a glass of water, a sip of water. You don't think it's true? On Yom Al-Qiyamah, the people in hellfire, you know what they're going to ask for? Huh? A sip of water. Oh, you and Jenna, oh, please just give us a sip of water. And they're going to say, it's haram for us to give you even a sip of water. Why? Because you had an opportunity to do it now in this life. Brothers and sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you to go in your pockets and spend money in the way of Allah. All of you dads to take some time to spend with your children. Now, inshallah, teach them and to train them 
and to transform this currency in the currency of the hereafter. Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Now brothers and sisters, we have um, a few moments. Anyone would like to make a statement or ask a question? Feel free. Okay, if um, anyone is too bashful and they want to write it down, brother or sister, they can. But if anyone would like to raise their hand and, and they could address it or even make a point, inshallah, feel free. Yes, my brother. Say again, using? Using five. I'm um, not quite familiar with the hadith that you're talking about. I don't know exactly what Hadith is speaking about, but it's true. We have to use everything we can before it's too late. But I don't know exactly what Hadith you mean, but Jazakallah Khadr. No problem, brother, inshallah. Yes, my brother. You spoke about spending money. Inshallah, brothers, maybe they, they need to know which way, what, what is it to be happy spending money. Oh, man, that's easy. We have an MSA here? Where's the MSA? I tell you how you can do it right now. You can spend some money on the MSA. They need some money. So the first thing you could do is go in your pocket. Do we need any money tonight? A little donation? If somebody, inshallah, could donate to... Let's donate tonight, inshallah, because if we do this, this will go to our account on Yom Qiyamah. In fact, can we, do you have a bucket? Let's get a bucket. Let's get a box. Let's get rid of some of this dunya here. I'm serious. Let's get, let's get rid of some of this money in our pockets and let's donate it to the MSA. That's the number one thing we can do. Another thing we can do, brother, inshallah, and sisters, and um, obviously, each, how many masters do we have here in this area? Five? Obviously, every masjid, I'm sure, needs money. And really, just to keep the masjid operating every week requires money. That. Brother, I'm going to tell you something. Every time a, a, a mother or father even spends money, food, to, uh, lawful money to spend on their, on their family, that's for them sadaqah also. Madrasa to Islami for schools, for jihad, fisa bilillah, and for da'wah to Islamia. There's an infinite way we can spend our money, obviously, uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's go. Let's go now. Bring, start with me first. You've got to always start with the speaker. So please, brothers and sisters, I don't see anybody going in their pockets. Just make a donation, inshallah. Yes, my brother. Actually, the, the, the difference between good deeds and ibadah, there's none. They're the same. قَالَ يَقُولُ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى مَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنُّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I've only created jinn and men to worship me. And so this worship, we taught any good deed that we do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually ibadah. And ibadah in the formal sense is salat and siyam and those kinds of things. But there are many hadith where the Prophet taught us even given uh, feeding our families is sadaqah. So um, even, even eating halal food is, is, is doing a good deed and it's, and it's ibadah. And even when a man and his wife is together, that's even is, is ibadah because we're doing it the halal way. So we don't ever want to think that um, we want to limit in any way um, this ibadah. It's actually worship. Okay? Yes, ma'am. You're implying that when you spend your money, like you donate it, it's better than to keep it in the bank. But if you're uh, 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 sorry, it's better to what? It's better to donate your money and use it for good deeds. So because it's going to take the currency in the hereafter. But isn't it, wouldn't it also be positive 
to save the money if you have children or somebody that needs it after. You also get the deeds for the money that you leave behind for the people who need it. Yeah, it's, a, it's actually a good question. Brothers we, and sisters, we never imply that you can't save money for some things. You may save money to buy a house, for instance. You may save money for your children's education. Now, that's okay. We're not, we're not talking about that. And um, certainly, if you save money for that purpose, that's right. The thing that we're talking about is leaving behind so much wealth. The point is that after you die, that wealth no longer belongs to you. That's the key. And if you spent $18 billion while you are alive for good, then you get credit for the $18 billion. If you leave that $18 billion behind and someone else inherits that money, that person, how they spend it, they will get the blessings for how they spend that money. For the moment that you die and you bury, that money doesn't belong to you. That's the point. And you have, we have to be careful of, of hoarding wealth. So I don't say you can't save. Certainly you can save with a plan. You have a plan. We're saving money to buy a school. We're saving money to send our children to school. That's, that's certainly okay. I don't think that you can get the same amount of hasanat from spending something or something that you left behind and didn't spend it. Again, if you have the intention of, for instance, you're leaving it for your children's education, then you're going to get the reward for that. But if you just leave all of this wealth behind and, and some of you just didn't spend, then certainly it's going to go to the ones who get it. Type. While wearing hijab, is it okay to allow some hair to show? <laughs> no. I know that this is not the topic for today, but I would be very pleased if you would donate your thought. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, the, the idea of hijab is, is to cover. Now, certainly if a little strand of hair get, get out there and it, and it slips out, that's one thing. But in the malahmalu binyat, don't like, you know, go in the mirror and say, well, let me put a little bit out there and put up. You can't do that. But we should. The, the hijab is for covering, inshallah. So sisters, when you wear hijab, try to cover. Try to cover all the hair. But if some, something gets out, okay, mashallah. But make the intention, inshallah, to cover, to cover all of it. Ah, good question. How can a person stop himself from overspending clothes even if he gave... Uh, charity to help people and th this is the way inshallah one of the things that alhamdulillah Islam always teaches us is balance and we neither we neither we neither um, spin trips or we go to the extreme and hoard money somewhere in between so one of the ways that can help inshallah to to spend the money on many worthy causes and alhamdulillah we have a lot of worthy causes here in the, in the Miami area Okay, I have uh, here in Miami, oh, I live here in Miami and I have two kids. One of them go to school. My only hope is that my kids go to an Islamic school, but nobody is interested in working for the first thought. If you... If you can, we want you to encourage people so something about this and try to work it. I thought I had bad, head, bad headwriting. I, I got the idea. Abundance says, let me say this. There's no full-time school in this area? Is there? Not yet. Inshallah, it's the planning? You plan to do so? Okay, good. How far is that from here? Alhamdulillah. Brothers and sisters, there's going to get a, uh, there will be a time, inshallah, there will be many schools in this area. In New York City, we have 17 full-time Muslim schools. And even 17 full-time Muslim schools in New York City, you should ask me the question, what percentage of our youth go to those full-time Muslim schools? What would you think? Less than 5%. 
That means even 17 full-time schools is not enough in New York City. What I would suggest to you is this. Alhamdulillah, make it in your niya, because I think, brothers and sisters, that we cannot do without full-time Muslim schools, personally. I believe that. And that uh, even the um, citizens of this country uh, have tremendous complaints about the public schools. Um, but what we did in New York City before we could afford a full-time Muslim school, we had what's called, what was called Project Prelude. We found uh, the best, what we thought the best public um, elementary school. I think it was uh, PS 173. And we went to the principal and said, listen, we have a lot of Muslims. We'd like to send them to your school. And we sent about 70 Muslims to that one public school. And as a result of that, they hired two Muslim teachers. We had a classroom that they gave us for Salat, for Islamic studies, for Arabic. And we, they bused them to, to that school every day and took them home. And on Fridays, they would go home early to go to Juma prayer service. You may say, well, what's the benefit of that? The benefit of that is that in the classrooms, instead of having only one Muslim or two Muslims in the school, we had seven and eight Muslims in each classroom. So they got a chance to be together. In the cafeteria, they were together. So until we had a full-time school, we had what's called Project Prelude, where we were able to, um, inshallah, um, get some, some benefit until we were able to get our full-time Muslim schools. Okay, a Muslim charitable organization um, incorporated has been established. My body needs help, or uh, anybody needs help, or want to, oh okay, or want to make a donation, I got you. A Muslim charitable organization incorporated has been established. Anybody who needs help, or want to make a donation, please call Dr. Hussein. Is Dr. Hussein here? Where's Dr. Hussein? He's not here. There's a phone number here, 954, who knows Dr. Hussein? Okay, so this is legitimate. Okay, 95, who knows him? No, <laughs> I was just kidding. 954-938-0087, and this is good. And brothers and sisters, believe me, Allah knows we need these kinds of organizations. Can I tell you, how many imams are here? We have one here. How many imams we have here? Two. Imams, do you notice another one? Do you notice in the last few years, more people coming to you asking for sadaqah than ever before? I don't know whether you notice or not. Do you, have you noticed? Have you noticed? Every day in our community, uh, 10, 15 people a day come with needs. And we have to address these needs. And organizations like this, alhamdulillah, what's the name of that organization? Muslim Charity. Okay, great. So please, um, again, uh, Dr. Hussein at 954. I don't see nobody writing it down. Every imam should be writing it down. Oh, you know the, oh, you know the record, good. 954-938-0087. Yes, somebody had a hand up? Somebody had a question? Yes, brother. If you have gold, the cat, yes. Yes, we have to pay. In in fact, one of the most intricate kitab uh, hadith, kitab al in detail. In what item? Gold, silver, cows, to pay the zakat, inshallah. So what I would suggest you do to talk to the local imams here and figure out how much gold that our family have, even if she has gold, yes. She has to pay a, a, a zakat on that. So talk to the imam and find out, you know, how much is the, the minimum and what percentage they have to pay. Even so using it, what, as you mean, as jewelry? Yes, of course. Yes. But what I suggest you do, again, talk to the, to the local imams here and you can get it, trying to figure out. Some of, some of it is very intricate. But you can figure out, inshallah, how much to pay on uh, zakat on, on gold. Uh, yes, brother. Could you hold on one second, sisters, inshallah? Again? 
Uh, again? I think it would be excellent. If, you are, if you're in a, a public school and there's Muslims there, I recommend strongly that you get together in some kind of group. In the colleges, they call them MSA. In the junior high school and high school, alhamdulillah, I can do the same thing. They may call them some kind of fraternity group, but the purpose of that is to come together to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and strengthen each other. I definitely recommend that you do that. And brothers and sisters, let's face it, it's very difficult to, for our children to be in a, in a public school and um, uh, not surrounded by Islamic models and things like that. So definitely, brother, I, I recommend. What school do you go to? High school? Do they have such an organization in your, in your school? Oh, Allah Akbar, you're in the verge of making one. Great. Maybe, inshallah, the next time I come, you let me know about it? I'm going to ask you about it. What's your name? Samir. Yes, yeah, Samir, inshallah. All the way in the back, brother, yes. Yeah, I mentioned uh, earlier that the Prophet said, إِذَا مَاتَ الْإِنسَانُ إِنْ قَطْعَ مَالَهُ I didn't tell you the, the end of the hadith. إِلَّا إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَثَ Except for three. When a person dies, their wealth is cut off except for three. And one is sadaqa jariya, as you know. When a person um, spends money um, in sadaqa, that continues. He builds a masjid, for instance. And uh, a person continues to get benefit from that masjid. As long as that person, people continue to benefit from the masjid, if he helped to build it, then he gets some credit for it, even though he died. And a knowledge that benefits, ilman, knowledge that benefits, a person writes a book, he leaves a tape, and he instructs people, and even the brothers in his grave, but people read his book and learn knowledge from him, learn a hadith from him, learn the ayat from Quran, then that person gets reward. Also, righteous offspring who make dua for their parents who have died, their deeds continue to grow, to grow insha'Allah. And there are other things that we, um, um, uh, we do in this life. Is, and like, same thing, uh, planting a tree. If you plant a tree, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, everything that eats from that tree, even if someone steals from that tree, you get some of the reward, even though you may be dead, insha'Allah. So these are ways that um, a per if a person is smart, that they will continue to try to get some good deeds even though they have died already. Okay. <laughs> How come every time we go to um, a program, someone asks us this question? Is it permissible to eat that meat from the supermarket? and restaurants that are not halal. Brothers and sisters, listen. Listen. Certainly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us permission to eat the meat of Ahli Kitab. We know this. No one can argue this. Hmm? But sometimes we have to be careful. If you know that Ahli Kitab, the people of the book, they do not slaughter the meat properly, you can't eat it, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you permission to eat the food of the people of the book. Meaning that the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to eat the food of the people of the book is the assumption that the people of the book is doing the right thing. Can we eat, for instance, a Christian invites us to his house and he serves us pork? Can we eat the pork? No, because it contradicts an ayah from the Quran. We can't eat khanzir, even though they're the people of the book. Hmm? Now, brothers and sisters, you go to a Christian's house, right? People of the book. And they go in the backyard, right? And, you, and you're watching them in the backyard, and they got a stick. And they call the cow, and they start beating the cow. Boom, boom, boom. And then they slaughter the cow and serve it to you. Can you eat it? Some of you have doubt? Of course not. You can't eat a thing that's beaten to death. Anyway, as long as the people of the book, if they slaughter correctly, it's no problem. The Jews, Orthodox Jews, no problem. Kosher meat, no problem. In my opinion, in my opinion, Allahu Alam, I tried to follow the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, da'ma yirbuk illa ma yirbuk. 
leave off that which is doubtful for that which doesn't cause you any doubt. I don't say that the meat in the supermarket is haram. I don't say that. That's not my position. I'm saying I don't eat it only because I have serious doubts about how they slaughtered it. I don't eat it. I can't say that it's haram. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that my experiences, a lot of them, they don't slaughter it correctly. Especially you have places where you have a lot of halal meat market. Go to the halal meat market if that's possible. If there's, no, if there's, no, if there's not possible, then Allah alam. Um, so again, I don't want to contradict what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. What, are, what if you help the needy, but they are not Muslims? Do we uh, get thawab? Well, subhanAllah, look, look at the ayah from the Quran. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ I've only sent you, O Muhammad, as a mercy to all of the worlds. Look at the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu A woman prostitute. Went in the well and drank water. And when she came out, she saw a dog that was thirsty. A what? Dog, kalbun, dog that was thirsty. And she went back in the well, put the sh water in the shoe, put the shoe in her mouth, climbed out of the well, and gave a dog water. And the Prophet said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave her, her sins. And one hadith said, enter her into Jannah. A prostitute gave water to a dog. Not water to a prophet, not water to a mu'min, not even water to a human being, but gave water to a dog. Certainly. Brother and sister, you know what? I remember I gave a lecture somewhere, in one, one city, I can't remember which city, and I, and I was um, running from my room, my hotel room, to go to the lecture hall. And I had to go up these long escalators. And so I was coming, I had my books in my hand, and there was an old woman right next to the escalator. And I said, excuse me, madam. And I went on the escalator, and I went up, and I'm going up. And as I was going up, something made me to look back at that old, as an old white woman. She wasn't a Muslim. And I said, you know what? That woman is trying to get up here, but she don't know how to do it. And so I went all the way up, and I went down and came back. And I said, madam, are you trying to get up there? She said, yes, sonny. I said, listen. You take my arm, I'll help you, come. And I took her up, and she got to the top, she thanked me, oh, thank you very much, thank you very much. Now some of them may say, but Imam Saraj, she's not a Muslim, how could you help her? I help her because I'm Muslim. You know when I'm on a plane, every week I'm on a plane, two or three times a week. And you know what, you ever see people struggling, trying to put their luggage in, right? So I see a lady struggling, right, trying to put the, her luggage up, uh, excuse me, madam, are you Muslim? Because if you're Muslim, I'm going to help. <laughs> the Prophet Muhammad was good to everybody. And maybe by our good example to people, maybe Allah will guide them to the light of Islam. Yes, Akhi. If the Prophet Muhammad said, even Allah punished a woman who locked a cat up and didn't feed the cat and wouldn't allow the cat go to feed itself and that cat died and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished that woman in the hellfire. Even animals, akhi. Even we're taught as Muslims to be good to animals even. So yes, uh, inshallah, there's a reward for doing good to any, uh, anyone, inshallah. And one of the best things, one of the best things that we can do for non-Muslims is to invite them to Islam. Yes, my brother. Please.
Um, the next question is a, is a technical question. I think I know the answer, Allah alam, but if the Imam can help me, inshallah. Can zakat money be donated to non Muslims? I don't think so. It is a category, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us categories in Quran, inma sadaqatu lil fuqara al wul misakin, and etc., etc., that what the zakat is due for. As far as I know, one of the, one of the things that zakat is given for is for people who recently come to Islam to help them, inshallah, to help them to get their hearts closer to Islam. But as far as giving zakat to a non muslim I don't think so, Allah alam. Uh, Imam, is that the correct, basically? Or, naam? No, no, I, I, yeah, no, but I'm asking, is, can we give zakat to non muslims Huh? No. Yes, brother? argue in the same ayah of the Quran that is referring to people who just became recently Muslims to make them stronger in the deen. No, 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 this, this ayah, the exact one you say to recently to bring their hearts to Allahu Alam, I'm saying Allahu Alam, but Jazak Al Khair. New Muslims, so as I understood it with the new Muslims, you know, Akhid, there's one hadith. By the way, there's one hadith, one beautiful hadith. Uh, there's a person that recently accepted Islam, and the Prophet Muhammad wasalam, gave him uh, a, a, a valley of sheep. And he went back to his people. He says, Yeah, people become Muslims because Muhammad, وسلم, he gives in a way that you never fear poverty. Yeah, he went to all his people, you should become Muslim. And the one Sahaba said, Many people, they come to Islam for one thing. They may be for dunya. But soon, Islam becomes more love for them than anything. So from people, really, so I've known cases where a man, Allahu Alam, a man come because these Muslim women are beautiful, and I want one of these Muslim women, and they become Muslim, and they become sincere Muslim, Allahu Alam. And same thing with, 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 uh, with, with women, uh, uh, be, becoming Muslims. Alhamdulillah, Allahu Alam. Jazakallah khaira. Yes, brother. If anyone, one of the beautiful things about Al-Quran and about Islam is everything has its dalil. We may have evidence, proof. We may have differences of opinion about different things, but the beautiful thing about it is everyone must bring their dalil. Ya yuladhina aminu ati Allah wa ati Rasul wa uli amru min kum fa inta naza'tum fi shay'in fa rudu ila Allah wa Rasul in kum tum tu'minun billah wa yom akhir. Oh you believe, obey Allah, Obey the messenger and those charged with authority among you. If you differ with anything, refer back to Allah and the messenger. If it is, you believe in Allah on the last day. If someone tells you that a non-Muslim is not allowed to go in the masjid, they have to give you some evidence from Quran and Sunnah. What evidence would they give? And we have to be the kind of people that, alhamdulillah, we accept evidence, we, we accept dalil. No problem, brother. You say a non-Muslim cannot come into the masjid, please give me some dalil. According to what I read of history, even the Prophet Muhammad received non-Muslims in the masjid. I've seen many cases like this, and I don't know any uh, scholars that say a non-Muslim can't come to the masjid. I don't know such a thing. And again, I'm open if they just simply give us the evidence we accept it, inshallah. Yes, ma'am. Discussion earlier about the nation of Islam, and I'd like to know your opinion about calling members of the nation my brother or sister. Oh boy, what a question! She said 
They had a conversation earlier about the members of the Nation of Islam. How many heard about the Nation of Islam? He said, what is your opinion about calling them my brother? Good question. Let me give you the technical answer first. Innam al-mu'minuna ikhwa. The believers are brothers. Now, black people who are not Muslims are not my brothers. They're my kaumi. They're my people. Black people, white people, male and female, who are, are Muslims, are my brothers. Al-Muslim, akhul Muslim. A Muslim is a brother to a Muslim. Sahih? Taib. If a person is not a Muslim, are they our brother? What? You act like you're not sure? No, Akhi. There's no doubt. Within, they're not brothers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a new definition. This definition is based on deen. Al Muslimu Akhul Muslim. A Muslim is a brother. This is what the Prophet said. A Muslim is a brother to a Muslim. Inam al Mu'minun. Ikhwa Allah says only the, only the believers are brothers. So the real question is are they Muslim? That's the question. Now, brothers and sisters, by the way, I'm an expert on the nation of Islam. Ask me why. I was a minister in the nation of Islam. And there was a very famous uh, minister in the nation of Islam. Many of you may know him, Jeffrey Twelvex. Did any of you hear from him? Jeffrey, minister Jeffrey Twelvex? That was me. <laughs> Like my brother there in the nation, he was in there from 1970, imam, minister, uh, imam from, uh, you were minister, uh, minister uh, in the nation from 70 to 75. And I came in 1969. And let me tell you something. Can I share this personal, a personal story with you? But we got to keep it here. <laughs> be careful with that camera. I let you film it, but be careful. There was about... Three or four years ago, in New York City, one of the big ministers of the nation of Islam over one of the temples, I invited him to my house, him and one of his lieutenants. And we spoke and spoke and spoke. At three o'clock in the morning, I gave them both shahada. This was a minister in the nation of Islam in Brooklyn over a temple took shahada, him and his lieutenant. And the brother was, he said, oh man, oh man, I'm telling the truth. And all. I said, well, calm down, man. You got to calm down, man. You got to be wise now. He went back. His first sermon was Tawheed, the oneness of Allah. The people were so upset, they called Minister Farrakhan. And I don't want to say his name because I don't want to get anybody in trouble. He says something wrong with the minister. I think Siraj did something to him. And the lieutenant left and became Muslim. This minister, the minister Farrakhan, brought him back to Chicago. And he stayed there for a long time to reindoctrinate him. He came back, called me on the phone. Imam Siraj, I want to speak to you. I was at the masjid, and he came to visit us. What happened is that he was reorientated into the doctrine of the nation of Islam. And he was kind of like debating with me. And we were talking, he brought two of his um, people from his temple. And it came time for Salat Isha. I'll never forget this. Called the Adhan, and I said, brother, we have to stop and make Salat. He said, I know. And he got in the ranks. He just finished telling me that God came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad. Telling me Elijah Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. I went to him and said, Minister, please come. Before I made this a lot, I invited, I said, Minister, please come, and the two brothers, please come. 
I said, Minister, I want to ask you a question. Do you consider me your brother? He said, yes, Imam, I do. I said, now you ask me the same question. He said, don't you consider me your brother? And I said, no, but let me tell you why. The same thing that I'm telling you, it hurted me to have to do that. But I cannot have people standing in the rings who when they pray, they pray to a man and not to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I couldn't do it. And even though my heart felt like I wanted to embrace him, hope to bring him, I couldn't violate our principle by breaking the ranks and let such a person, let such a person pray with us. To answer your question honestly, truthfully, let's be straight up, straight up, no, we cannot. And let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. By the way, brothers and sisters, it is my opinion, and Allah knows best, and I was speak, speaking to, to a brother earlier, that most of the members of the nation of Islam, in my opinion, will become Muslim. Let me tell you why I believe that. Anytime an organization is headed by the charisma of a leader, usually when that leader dies, the movement dies. In 1975, when Elijah Muhammad died, the nation of Islam effectively was dead. Minister Farrakhan himself and most of the people in the nation of Islam, including Muhammad Ali, and many, many left the teachings and the doctrines of Elijah Muhammad and became Muslim, many of them, including myself, alhamdulillah. And, and so with his death, then the movement had died. Three years later, Farrakhan decided to raise up the nation of Islam again. A couple of things. Minister Farrakhan calls himself Muslim. I can't take that away from him if he calls himself Muslim. But we have to be honest with each other. Some of the uh, Muslims around the country became disappointed in me because Minister Farrakhan invited me to speak at the Mayor Man March. And I refused to go. He said publicly that he wouldn't even go unless I went with him. Why didn't I go? Because if I go and went to the Million Man March, you could say, Imam Sadaj, you have an opportunity to speak to millions of people, perhaps. But what would happen is that I would authent authent authenticate him and his movement because he would say, see, Imam Sadaj was there. So I couldn't do that. In the same way he invited me to speak in, in the, the UN recently, same reason I didn't go. Now listen to this and then we try to make us to understand why it's important, inshallah. You know one day I was with Minister Farrakhan, we had breakfast together. And we're close. He comes to New York, he calls me. I go to Chicago, I go to his house, I see him. And every time I see him, Allah knows, I invite him to Islam. Because I think, by the way, that if this man became a Muslim, I think Islam will grow rapidly in this country. Allahu Akbar. He's skillful. To such a degree, a couple of years ago, a World Series baseball game in Atlanta, Georgia, the same night that the Braves played World Series, Farrakhan spoke in Atlanta, Georgia, and outdrew the Atlanta Braves. 90,000 people came to hear him speak. Who else do you know? What Muslim you know who can attract the kinds of crowds as Minister Farrakhan? You don't know of me. So even as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided Umar ibn Khattab, and Islam became strong as a result of Umar ibn Khattab, perhaps if Minister Farrakhan becomes a Muslim, that he can do all of that for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is my dua, by the way. So Minister Farrakhan called me, and we went to breakfast together in New York City. I said, Minister Farrakhan, I got to ask you a question. Now, listen to the Quran. Ya ayu aladhina aminu kutiba alaykum musiyam kama kutiba aladhina min qabalikum la alukum tahtakun shahru ramadan aladhi unzil fi al-Quran. The month of Ramadan is the month in which Allah revealed al-Quran. When the Muslims fast? When the Muslims fast? Month of Ramadan. I said, Minister Farrakhan, please tell me 
If Allah says in Quran that we should fast in the month of Ramadan, why are you fasting in December? Good question. Can I tell you what he told me? Are you ready? He said, Imam Siraj. He says in the Quran, it says, those who are sick are on a journey can make it up days later. My people are on a spiritual journey. <laughs> sure did. Lies my witness. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم صلوا كما رأيتموني أصلي pray as you see me pray how do Muslims pray الله أكبر الله أكبر how do Muslims pray صلوا كما رأيتموني أصلي pray as you see me pray make sajda pray they don't pray like that in the nation of Islam in the nation of Islam they turn to the east and they go like this I can tell you a thousand and one things, brother can tell you too, the differences between the nation of Islam and Islam. Do you know in Islam, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes halal and haram? Now brother tell, he will, he will stop me from lying. In the nation of Islam, it was haram to eat peanuts. How many of you eat peanuts? Oh, oh. And you couldn't eat peanuts, nor its derivatives, peanut butter. Now, when I was a young boy, I used to love peanut butter and jelly. When I left the nation of Islam, the first thing I did made me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> yeah. So, brothers and sisters, yes, they're my people, but they're not brothers. And we have to be honest. And you don't mean you have to be hostile to them. No, I'm not. I talk to them straight up. And I'm, I try to be honest with them. And alhamdulillah, we've given a number of them shahada. Even the same minister, the same minister in, in Brooklyn recently told me, Imam, we like to be the ministers in New York, under, in the nation of Islam, would like to be a part of the Majesty Shore of New York, to lead the lead of the imams. I said, minister, come, and we will meet. And we will discuss the criteria to become a member of the Majesty Shorter. But we can't stop giving da'wah. And we should not be, in my opinion, uh, we have different styles of da'wah. But don't be hostile toward them. Invite them in a nice way. And you'll see, inshallah, maybe many of them will become Muslim. I don't know. Maybe Minister Farrakhan himself. You know he's 60-something years old. I think 66 years old. He's going to die one day. And what's going to happen to his followers? Many of them will come by you. Be prepared to meet them when they come. Treat them good, inshallah, when they come. Inshallah, they will be coming. I'm sorry, we got a couple, I'm sorry, we got a couple, I'm, I know. Yes, ma'am. Actually, it's a good question. I actually saw the question here. Did you wrote that question? Okay, you really, put, you want to get that question, huh? Uh, actually, I, I wanted to finish this Nation of Islam. I'll come right back to that. Anyone else uh, point on that? I think she wanted to make a follow-up on that point. Anyone? Yes, I thought so. And he was sounding like a true Muslim. If you heard, uh, he's like, he said the Shahada and all that and there's no God. Uh, you, I was surprised that... The, the problem, let me tell you the problem. There's two problems we have. Several problems we have. One is that, that when they say, they say the shahada, ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammad rasulullah. But when they say they bear witness that there's no God but Allah, they mean Farid Muhammad. There's a difference. And number two, when they say Muhammad Rasulullah, they mean Elijah Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. You see? And that's the difference. And then the other thing is that, but he also bears witness a Prophet Muhammad والسلام, being a Muslim, uh, being the messenger. So they sometimes they go back and forth. Even Akhi in the ayat of the Quran, وَإِذَا لَقُوا الَّذِينَ آمِنُوا قَالُوا آمَنَّا وَإِذَا خَلَاوْا إِلَىٰ شَيَّتِينِهِمْ قَالَ إِنَّا مَعَكُمْ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْتَحْزِيُونَ And when they meet those who believe, they say, we believe. But when they are alone with the evil ones, they say, we are really with you, we were only mocking. 
So sometimes we have to be careful, taqiyya. To say one thing in front of people and another thing in other words. So I want them to become Muslim, inshallah. Taib. Taib. You want to follow up on this? You were saying um, how you didn't want him in the ranks to learn Salah because, what was it? Oh yeah, because you don't know how he's, like... No, I do know how he thinks. That's the point. If I didn't know how he think, I, I no, 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 let me say this. I do know how he think. We just finished having a two-hour argument, or hour argument, about his theology. He went back to the theology of Elijah Muhammad. So that is why I didn't let him pray within, uh, with us. You don't know everybody in the ranks, how they're thinking, alone, you know. So if he's treating right. like you and saying what you say, then it's nobody's fault. You know, he's not going to be breaking the... No, 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 no. See, the, you, you're right if I didn't know what he thought. You were right. I can't just go out and say, um, I think you don't believe right, so come out. No, I can't do that. But I just finished speaking with him. One hour, we were arguing his positions. That's shirk. If you know that someone is belief is shirk, you can't let them join the ranks. I, I just believe me, take it from me. If there was a way, sister, for me to let him to, to pray, I would have done it. I would, I, would, I would have searched for a way to do it, but I couldn't in, in good consciousness. I think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have been pleased with me. Okay, if you know someone is worshiping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know that. Can't be your brother, and they can't pray with the Muslims. Bow down with those who bow down, inshallah. Yes, ma'am. This will be the last. Anyone who has a question or point? This will be the last two, inshallah. You had a point, question? Okay, you, you can do it, inshallah. One, two, three, that's it. Thank you. One, two, three. Yes. Up at the Pope, yes. Now, brothers, you gotta be careful. The, uh, we read recently with the Pope, um, he didn't accept the theory of evolution. What he actually did, from, from what I understand, what I read into it, is that they are not necessarily um, a, a total contradiction in some aspects of the evolutionary theory. You know, for instance, you know the ayat in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and earth fi sitati ayamin in six days, thumma istawa ala arsh, and then he ascended the throne. Six days, what does it mean? Does it mean six days? Like, does it mean perhaps 6,000 years? As one ayat in Quran says, a, uh, a day with Allah is a thousand years. Is it possible 6,000 years? Or is it possible in the ayat in Quran it says the, the ruh and the angels ascend to Allah a day which is 50,000 years? Is it perhaps that? Allah knows best. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam, how long did it take to create Adam? Certainly you, you can say Allah said kun fayakun, being it is. But does that mean that Adam occurred like this? Because look at the ayat that I, I, I talked about today. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِنَ الْبَعْثِ فَإِنَّ خَلَقَنَاكُمْ مِنْ تُرَابٍ ثُمَّ مِنْ نُطْفَةٍ ثُمَّ مِنْ عَلَقَةٍ ثُمَّ مِنْ مُضْغَةٍ If you have doubt about the resurrection, resurrection, consider I created you from huh? dust, then sperm, then clot, then fetus. You see, so it's the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to everything we see is to create things in stages. So maybe Adam wasn't just like, Allah said, boom, and Adam jumped up like that. Maybe we don't even believe it that way, perhaps. So, so I think what the Pope was saying is that, in which a lot of other even religious people are saying, there's not 100% contradictions. And, and by the way, um, some Muslim, I was surprised, who asked me the other day, he says, um, was, 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 um, was animals created before man? Of course it was. Of course. Man was the last thing created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Yom, Yom al-Jum'ah. On the la last part of the day, between Asra and Maghrib, according to Hadith, everything else was created before, even animals, even trees, suns, every everything was created before man. So, yes, man was the last thing created. O okay, so, I, I, the, I don't, you know, I, was I, I, I read it very carefully, and it didn't say we believe in evolution, no. But that there were, there were some things that may be compatible. And they, they, they let it, it was kind of vague. Um, yes, my brother. Are you running down? I don't know which is your question. What's the, just tell us basically what is it? Well, it's just a brother, a black American brother, who asked me to be, asked us, other brothers, to be messy of his mother's dead. She was dying. She, she died or she died? She was. She was dying. She was dying. She was not Muslim. She's not Muslim. She was asking us. 
asking us if they need a bus to come up here and we can't see it on her. She's still now living. She passed. Yeah. And nobody volunteered to three or four brothers to be present then. I did. Have I done the right thing? The question is, um, there was a, a sister dying who was not a Muslim, and, um, and uh, the, 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 the son, he's Muslim, asked the brothers to read Surah to Yasin for his mother who was dying, and he said he did it, no one else did it, he did it do the right thing. You know this ayat in the Quran, إِنَّكَ لَا تَحْتِ مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَ اللَّهِ يَحْتِ مَنْ يَشَاءَ You cannot guide whom you love, but Allah guides to the straight path whomever he wills. If you read the tafsir or the explanation of this ayat, it's talking about the death of Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad When he was dying on his deathbed, the Prophet didn't read Surah Yasin for him. But what he did say, the most important thing, Kul la ilaha illallah, say that there's no God but Allah. If you want to do something for a dead person who's non-Muslim, follow the sunnah and invite them to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That would be my advice. How then could we recite the Qur'an for a person who haven't first accepted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What would it mean? It w huh? Then if she wasn't conscious, what becomes the purpose of it? I understand, and let me tell you something. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for your, your niyyah. Let me, let me tell you why I say this. You know, especially a brother like myself who have many family members and, and old acquaintances who are not Muslims. And sometimes, you know, maybe they die and you want to do something for them, but you cannot disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and the Messenger. And because they're not Muslims, different if, as long as they're living, do everything you can to try to invite them to Islam, to try to treat them good. But I think things like that we can't do. I don't think that we have the right, Islamically, to recite Surah Al Yaseen, Allahu Alam. Maybe someone here, Imam, you can't. Yes, brother? No, the person was still alive, he said. They were still alive. No, no, I, I agree with you. We got, I, no, see, our brother make a point, it's well taken. Sometimes we, we, we should be careful even doing things even to Muslims that we may think is part of Sunnah that not necessarily part of Sunnah. Um, but I have read some hadith where a person is alive reading Surah Tujah saying Muslim, yes. But not, not on the dead person. Yes, brother. Yes, you have a book. Yes, is the heart of the Quran. Read it on your bed. On your bed? Yes. Thank you. But in terms of reading it for a non Muslim, I would say no. It's for everything that I know, everything that I know. Imam, yes. Yes, and he put it. Yes, his own mother. Jazakallah Brother, listen to me. I don't say that to beat you and throw stones at you, anything like that. No, anyone should. But we should try to get as much as we can, because we want to do the right thing, inshallah. And because we don't want to, uh, you know, to be displeasing to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Even Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, um, at one point, asked even for like for dua for his father when he should not have done it at that particular time. So we have to be careful. And the last question, inshallah. Is it okay to use images um, in the classroom setting when you teach children? Like, give me an example. Um, like to have um, pictures of animals and people on the walls and say that. This is a good question. I want to say for the imam, inshallah. Um, the question is, can you use images like for children in teaching, like maybe teaching a child this is a giraffe, this is a lion, so forth and so on. Um, I would rather the Imam, inshallah, why don't you come up here, Imam, and he will give us the answer. Uh, yes, come, Imam, yes. We know each other from Arizona, inshallah, and alhamdulillah, good brother, I love him very much. And I always like to share the rostrum when I'm up here. Don't like to stay up here by myself. Alexandra, please. I think the, the only images are allowed in Islam, uh, the, the children toys. Prophet Muhammad Sallam made uh, an exception for that. And uh, we read in the seerah that when the Prophet Muhammad Sallam married Aisha, she came to his house with a horse with two wings. 
And he asked her, what is this? She said, the horse with two wings. She said, he, he told her the horses have no wings. So if they are toys uh, and to teach children, they are permissible. Other than that, we are not allowed as Muslims to have any images in the houses, any statues or any pictures even hanging in the walls of life, uh, human beings or animals. Because uh, the hadith is very clear that the angels will not enter, the angels do not, do not enter the house or the room where is a dog or a picture, a picture of a living, a living person or an animal. May Allah bless you. No, no, no problem with nature and uh, scenery, no problem with that. We have one, one last question. <laughs> Muhammad, I, I don't think there is any problem with that, but leave them, leave them live in the ocean, inshallah. inshallah. <laughs> Our brother says, let me share this with you in case the, you, you didn't know, again, something personal about my own life. Um, very few people know that I used to be an artist. And I used to be, before I became Muslim, and I used to paint portraits. Everyone who came to my house, I had to paint their portrait. I painted it in oil and watercolor and every kind of medium. When I became a Muslim, when I learned that we're not supposed to make images, I had two large envelopes of, 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 of pictures and paintings and I threw all of them away. And, and, and I say that to say that, let me tell you something, um, if, if no one ever told you this as an artist. You know the hadith you read, it says that on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, a person who makes an image, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will order that person to make it come alive and they won't be able to do it. Let me tell you something that you probably, no one ever can tell you or never told you before. I swear by Allah, when I used to make portraits of people, I used to sit down after my work, wallahi, and sit and wait for it to come alive. It's something that you don't know unless you're an artist who make pictures of people. There's something that does something to you when you make things like, like a real life person. Something happens to you as the artist. You become proud like a creator. Wallahi azim, I swear by Allah, I don't lie on Allah. Definitely when I was an artist, I used to feel this way. And I used to paint sometimes late at night, um, uh, two, three o'clock in the morning, painting pictures and waiting for it to come to life. So Allah is messing you no best, wallahi. So don't let us get out of the, the, the habit. And I know there's a lot of questions in terms of thick uh, about, you know, about these questions and how far, how far do we go, you know, images and things like that and pictures and things like that. There's a lot of discussion on that. Maybe tonight is not the forum because I'm not an expert on that. What I would recommend is to bring some of the scholars who, who are proficient on that area and who could um, uh, perhaps you know, tell us the difference between photographs, for instance, and, and paintings and statues and, and you know, what are all the hududs. Um, but, 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 but consider this. Try your best as much as you can, as, uh, as much as your ability to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger of Allah. And we will find out that a lot of times we do things simply because the people of this society do them and we become accustomed to them. Now, let, uh, let's face it. Hey, come on. Look, look. I'm not throwing this away. Who's that guy? Who's that guy? Don't you know who this is? <laughs> Washington. Come on, George Jefferson. I can't throw, I'm not going to throw it away. It would be much better to have, a, have money without these images on it. Be much better, wouldn't it be? Inshallah, we'll get to a, a time, inshallah, where we make our own money. They have no images on it. Driver's license to all of that, you know, passports. We recognize newspapers and things. We recognize all of these things. Um, so there's a lot of issues that we have to deal with in this modern time. Anything but those things that we have control over. Try not to get involved in those, those, kinds of, those kinds of images. Brothers and sisters, I thank you very much for being tremendously, tremendously patient. Look what the Prophet did. That's my example. Allah says we will not punish until we have sent a messenger. You have to strive, but you, but you have to depend on Allah. We read Quran for the sake of applying it.
The prophet was greatly hurt when Hamza was killed and his body ripped open and hanged, tore out his liver and bit from his liver. The mutilation and anger flushed through his system and he wanted to go to battle. And God revealed to him to relent. Be patient. You are the messenger of God. He's a man who obeys God. Because I know if they would have did that, my uncle, my wife, my, I'd probably do the same thing. It takes a lot of strength to be a Muslim and be peaceful. But that's our nature. Actually, properly defined, Islam means to achieve peace through submission to God, to Allah, the creator of all. Peace with God, within oneself, and if a person really is true to his or her faith, it would inevitably result in peace with the creation of God, human, animal, uh, inanimate objects even in the universe. And by submission here is meant willing, conscious, loving submission to God and trusting in the validity of his teaching and his guidance. In other words, the ultimate objective of normative or true Islam is to achieve complete harmony between the human and the creator on one hand and between the human and the creation of the creator on the other hand. When African people were taken into sl in slavery from the west coast of Africa and quiet as it's kept, we are now understanding that maybe close to 30% of the slaves taken from, from the, uh, the Guinea coast of West Africa were Muslims. Close to 30%. In Bahia, in Brazil, which was the largest slave population created by the Portuguese, there was a huge slave revolt in Bahia. A successful slave revolt to the point where the Hausa and the Fulani or the Fula people who, 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 were the, who were taken into slavery in that part of the world, were able to defeat the Portuguese, they were given boats, and they returned to West Africa. And you can go to Lagos today, and you can find Brazilian mosques, which is, which, which is a mosque, a house of worship, built by people who were captured, taken to Brazil, and then won their liberation and returned to West Africa.